After a crazy week three for fantasy football, how much of your fab should you be spending on Khalil Herbert, Bears running back? That's a trick question. You should have already had him on your roster, unless you're uh, <laughs> stupid like me and you dropped him on Saturday. Welcome into the show, the Pretend GM. I'm Alfredo Brown. You can follow me on Twitter at the Pretend GM, and I am with my Brown buddy, my Mocha <laughs> Macho Man, the Doctor of Delight, Vig Nash <laughs> Dora Swami. You can follow him on Twitter at Dr. Vig, you didn't know I was going to drop all of those nicknames. I did not, did not know that was coming today. Every once in a while, like, I feel like you just deserve kind of like a boxer's intro to the show. Every once, you know, whatever. We got a lot to talk about today. We're going to be recapping week three, going through our macro data refinement brought to you by Sleeper. Uh, Vig, that's a little nod to the show severance that we like so much. We're just going to be taking these numbers and, uh, you know, trying to figure stuff out. Yeah. Can you, like, you're going to tell me how these numbers make you feel, so to speak? Yeah, like, do they do they make you sad? Do they make you happy? That's what we're gonna go over. Do today. they bring you joy? <laughs> yeah, for, for those of you that haven't seen Severance, go check it out on Apple Plus. Great show. Uh, we're also gonna be doing our rehab roundup. That's just a fun voice to do, and I'm gonna do it every single time we do the rehab roundup. Makes me feel like I should be selling a pickup truck or some beef jerky. But <laughs> Vig is gonna analyze injuries from week three and let you know how concerned you should be going forward. And then we're gonna go over our top waiver wire pickups for week four. But let's not kill the lead here. Khalil Herbert is the name on a lot of people's minds. And this is a guy that we've talked about at nausea Vig. Like this is a player that we have talked about all off season. He is potentially the most valuable waiver wire ad. And this is the kind of guy that you hold on to your, your free agent auction budget for, or fab as known in the fantasy community. Cause this is the kind of player that can win you your league. Okay. This week, 22 touches, 169 yards, two touchdowns. He, he should have already been on so many rosters, but Turns out he's still available in up to 50% of Yahoo leagues. No and way. Actually, uh, yeah, more, actually more. And available wow. in 75% of ESPN leagues. It's just crazy. I, I think that a lot of people, what happens is they roster these players from their draft. And after week one, they do these kind of like crazy uh, panic mode drops where they go and they pick up new players. And listen, I, I've seen crazy drops like this. I, I, I mentioned it. I dropped Khalil Herbert because someone in my league dropped Dalton Schultz and I need a tight end because I drafted Cole Komet like an idiot. So like there's, <laughs> there's a lot of players that you're going to find that are out there on waivers and Khalil Herbert's got a good matchup next week against the New York giants. It's a juicy one. So even if it's not long-term, it could just be a one week thing. David Montgomery though, he got hurt. Vig, talk to me about David Montgomery. Yeah. We wouldn't even be talking about Khalil Herbert if it wasn't for David Montgomery, which is a bit of a shame because anyone who's listened to the show, anyone who follows Alfredo on Twitter knows that we both love Khalil Herbert, but yeah, he, you know, the Texans defender sort of fell on him. He landed on his back and he kind of got rolled up. It just didn't look pretty. We don't really know what happened. It looked like potentially the ankle and the knee, you know, again, it's, it's hard. If you're speculating, you could speculate anywhere from this is a, a one to two game ankle sprain, maybe high ankle sprain, but that knee looks concerning to a lot of folks. It could be, you know, we're talking six to eight weeks with an MCL injury, high ankle sprain. It's hard to say. The big picture thing is look at when your league clears its waivers or it's when you can use your fab, but wait, there's going to be an MRI tomorrow. You're going to find out more tomorrow. So just don't, don't do any panic stuff yet, but should we consider something Alfredo is Khalil Herbert just better than David Montgomery. He got 150 yards, almost 31 PPR points, two things that David Montgomery has just never done. Yeah, I, I actually have. I've believed that Khalil Herbert is better than David Montgomery. Now, Monty went out and he had himself a nice game last week. Cool. Like, it's going to be expected. I'm not saying that Montgomery's a bad player. I just think that Khalil Herbert is actually that good of a running back. And he's been showing a lot of this ability in, in the rushing game, not necessarily in the passing game, but that looks like it's all kind of coming to fruition here. And the two touchdowns today was just a, a huge boost in scoring. So it's going to be really interesting to see what the Chicago Bears do. David Montgomery is in the final year of his contract. Khalil Herbert could be having his audition for 2023 or potentially the rest of this season. Mm -hmm. But what we like to do, Vic, is we like to have a teaching moment here. Okay, we're the show that wants to show our audience how to do things, right? You want to teach a man to fish, not just hand him the fish. And so we want to talk about how we determine our fab spending for a player like Khalil Herbert, because I'm sure a lot of people are going to have questions, right? So first thing you want to consider here is a player situation. So how long is David Montgomery going to be out? That's the thing that we're going to be finding out tomorrow. Probably when this podcast comes out, you'll have some more information on it. But, you know, Vig, this is an injury where, you know, it could have upwards of six to eight weeks where Montgomery is out, or it could be as short as, you know, one week. So we don't know. So we got to figure that out before you put your bid in there. Are you renting Herbert for short-term or long-term? And then what's the workload going to be like if Cleo Herbert is the running back? 
if he's going to be splitting with Tristan Ebner, it's probably going to be closer to like a 70-30. Khalil Herbert could be getting a lot of work in that offense. And then you got to think about your roster situation. Would you be starting this player every week? If you get Khalil Herbert, are you going to be starting him? Or are you putting Khalil Herbert up against, uh, let, let's say, kind of weird situation. Let's say it's like DeAndre Swift and uh, Christian McCaffrey, right? Like, you, probably not. But if you're a little bit more desperate at running back and you have D- Daryl Henderson and Travis Etienne, like I do, yeah, you're going after Khalil Herbert pretty pretty hard. And so that's when you got to think about what your desperation level is. So you taught us to think about the player situation and then your own roster situation. But how do we put that all together? So, you know, if we're thinking we find out more information tomorrow that you might just be, you know, Khalil Herbert's going to be a seasonal guy, someone you play for the entire season. Be prepared to spend like upwards of 60 percent of your fab. That might be necessary. If it's only four to six weeks, maybe half, 50, 55 percent. Three weeks or less, you're still going to have to spend a lot. The guy did really well. Still spend about 40 to 45% of your fab to get the, uh, t- sorry, to get Cleo Herbert. And I know we're, t- we're talking a lot about this, but this is going to be an important topic, right? So uh, the three weeks or even less, right? Remember that fantasy football is a weekly game. And this is all going to be based on how desperate you are to get a, a starting running back into your lineup. If you need a starting running back into your lineup, then you're going to have to spend up for him. And the other thing is you will know your league. Everyone seems to know their league a little bit better and there are some leagues that just they tend to spend more on running backs. They covet those running backs. They need them. If you know you're in a big zero RB league and you can just go and get Khalil Herbert for a little bit cheaper and go for it. I just I don't think that you'll regret having him on your roster. So I mentioned that I dropped Khalil Herbert on Saturday before the game started. I went and I picked up Dalton Schultz because I just found that it was weird that he was on waivers and I had Cole Komet. So I'll be trying to add him back to this team that is 0-3. And so one thing I heard is, you know, can you give real life examples of what you do, right? So I have this this team with running backs of Javante Williams, Travis Etienne, Devin Singletary, Miles Sanders, Daryl Henderson. Mm. It hasn't been a great year for me being 0-3. So if I can go with Javante Williams and Khalil Herbert as my starting running backs for however long I need to, yeah, I'm happy to spend 60% of my free agent auction budget or fab on Khalil Herbert if David Montgomery is going to be out for more than three games. Like, I'm willing to put down the money because I'm 0 3. I'm desperate. I have to make a move now, or my season could be basically done. Now, Vic, before we continue on and get to our macro data refinement, I just want to remind everybody, if you're watching, if you're here, smash that like and subscribe button on YouTube. It is so helpful for us. And if you have a question, there's going to be questions all throughout this week. And I know that sometimes the information we give you here on a Monday loses its luster by Tuesday or by Wednesday. But guess what? If you if you happen to catch this episode on one of those days and you have a question, drop that question in the comments and I will respond to each of them personally okay i promise you i'll get back to every single one of you that leave a comment here throughout the week also we have an audio version of the show so if you're watching on youtube guess what we have an audio version that you can listen to the podcast while you're in your car driving to work or you know you're just walking from your bedroom to your home office just to go and and sit down and work from home also if you can please leave a five star rating and review vig let's get to our macro data refinement 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 are you ready so before we do this we're starting the segment i need you to start give me like a little clap let's go give me a clap clap come on clap louder louder yes I don't know what to, we'll be here. Uh, to uh, talk oh. about Loa, it's three and Oa. He throw the ball really deep. Hey, to hey. Uh, <laughs> talk about Loa, it's three and Oa. The Dolphins are in first place. Hey, stop, stop, stop. Sorry, I screamed stop. really loud into that mic. Happy Rosh Hashanah to our audience that celebrates. Listen, I cannot be contained right now. I am so happy, big. Dolphins are 3-0. Oh. Tua Tonga Valoa, man, he came out and, he, listen, he was slinging that ball until he had a little Gumby moment and couldn't walk. That was a really scary moment for him and for Dolphins fan alike. But give us our moment in the sun, dude, okay? The Dolphins are 3-0. Oh. They're the number one team in the AFC. And I promise you, I'm not this homer that's going to keep bringing up the Dolphins every episode. If you're with us for t- the first two episodes of this show here, it's twice that I've brought up Tua and the Dolphins. That's not normally me, but... Man, it is just exciting when you have a team that is performing the way they are. Dolphins are 3-0. They're outscoring opponents 35-5 to in the fourth quarter. Tua is second in the NFL in yards per attempt, fourth in completion percentage, fourth in passing touchdowns, second in quarterback rating. Uh, aside from that scary moment where he fell backwards, he hit his head, and uh, it turns out to be a lower back issue, which they, there's still a lot of questions surrounding that as well. The NFL is even looking into the concussion protocol, mm-hmm. uh, You know what, what went on there. Other than that, though, 
this was just such an exciting game from start to finish. Jalen Waddle goes over 100 yards again, nearly scored in a 45-yard deep ball. And I think that we could be in for even more fireworks this upcoming week where we got Thursday night football where the Dolphins take on the Bengals. Then you look ahead and the Dolphins have the Jets, the Vikings, the Steelers, the Lions, wow. a lot of juicy matchups for this team where you could see, I'm not going to try to get ahead of myself too much, but the Dolphins could not only just have a winning record, but there is an avenue here where this team is undefeated after all of those weeks. So I think Tua Tungavailoa needs to be considered a starting quarterback in your fantasy rosters for at least another five weeks. There is actually a decent possibility that the Dolphins if all this keeps up, could be 8-0, and Tua Tagovailoa could be a very, very viable and just good fantasy starting quarterback. I'm excited about Tua Tagovailoa. Devontae Smith had an absolute career day. Wide receiver for the Philadelphia Eagles. Eight receptions, 12 targets, 169 yards, and a touchdown. Um, the Eagles aren't passing a ton more last year, you know, about 30 attempts a game, and now they're at 32.6, 33 attempts a game. Um, but yeah, it, things looked really good for Devontae Smith today. Yeah, there was the big talk about the Eagles supposed to be passing a lot more, and they are. They're passing more, but it's not quite that commitment to the passing game that we were expecting. They've still been really good. They've still been really good, and Jalen Hurts should be in consideration for fantasy MVP right now for that three touchdown game. Vig, the Eagles play the Jaguars next week, your favorite team. So I'm going to ask you, you look at the numbers, you look at the data. How does it make you feel? Uh, not so great to tell you the truth. I think, you know, the Jags underrated defense. I played really well. Yes, we beat the Chargers. Yes, we beat the, you know, it was a depleted Chargers. We beat the Colts. are not really a great team at the moment. Um, and we struggled against commanders, but things are coming together. Our offense is clicking. Our defense is playing out of their minds. Really, really made it hard for Herbert to play today. So it should be a good matchup, but I do not see the Jags coming out of that with a win. I hope I am wrong. You mentioned the commanders. Carson Wentz, he does this to you guys every year, man. This redheaded ball of gas. I told you it was going to happen. He was just ready to explode. Carson Wentz turned into the proverbial pumpkin but it's not all bad for the commanders. Okay. Aside from Wentz, he threw zero touchdowns. He was sacked nine times. The, the Eagles got in his head. This was, he got pressured all over, but it wasn't all bad, right? Big. Dude, the team is still really good. Last week we talked about Curtis Samuel. The guy is the real deal. We always knew he had that. We forgot about it because he was injured all last year, but seven receptions on 10 targets and every single game this year, he has had more than nine targets. That has been eating into, you know, Dotson and McLaurin a little bit. But even Terry McLaurin today, 6 of 9 for 102 yards. And the reason we bring this up is think about these players moving forward. It might be a good even short-term trade. The Commanders have some juicy matchups coming up where they may put a lot of points on the fantasy scoreboard. They're playing the Dallas Cowboys, the Tennessee Titans, and the Chicago Bears coming up. So it should be pretty good. Yeah, that those are some numbers that make me very happy. Terry McLaurin, Curtis Samuel, Curtis Samuel in particular. Because I think that the the team is going out of their way to scheme for him. And he's getting some of that rushing work too. And just to see the, the, the nine plus targets in all three games so far, that's really, really encouraging it for him. I love it. A wide receiver that's in the opposite trend of that. And these numbers just make me downright sad. Vegas Darnell Mooney. I think he's absolutely oh. droppable in your leagues. Like it's not even a case of is he a wide receiver three or four or five. I just think he's droppable. I don't think he needs to be on your roster. I get it. He's had 96% route participation and he's been in the games, I guess is what you could say. Like he's been participating. That's nice. But five targets, two receptions for 23 yards. That is his best game of the year. Justin Fields has 45 pass attempts on the season. Vignesh, 45 pass attempts on the season. Josh Allen had 42 completions this week. The Bears passing offense is just something that I want no part of. And you know what? I'm not even, I'm not willing to do anything with Justin Fields right now. I think that all the signs were pointing to the Chicago Bears offense and this whole team being a wash for the season. Right now, the only shining light is Khalil Herbert. So aside from him, I don't know that I want any other part of this offense. I will say though, Every league has a Darnell Mooney stand, someone who just loves Darnell Mooney. And honestly, Alfredo and I are those people. So don't <laughs> drop Darnell, package him in a trade. Just, I mean, get rid of him when you can. Yes, he may do better than he can, no is one's, now. No one's going to give you anything worse. for Darnell Mooney. No one's going to give you anything. On to our next player, because we want to roll through these and we want to be quick, is Damian Pierce, fantasy Twitter darling, preseason darling, finally had his day. 
22 touches, 100 plus yards, and a touchdown. And you know, the Texans are going to have games where they can do this sort of thing with Damian Pierce, but overall, he's still sort of a matchup dependent RB2. But take away that touchdown, and he still got you, you know, a double digit game. So Damian Pierce, we love him. He did great. Um, but you know, if he's not getting touchdowns for you, he really, really is that matchup dependent RB2 for you. Yeah, what made me happy about the data there with him is that he's getting the volume. He's starting to get those touches that we want. And whenever you see a running back that's getting 22 touches in a game or 20 plus touches in a game, you're happy about that. That's what you want to see from, you know, an RB2. And I think you're right that he's going to be matchup dependent going forward. This was a game that they were in and it was close. Mm -hmm. Vig, I got to ask you a question about some running backs here, though. The Patriots. Okay. Damian Harris, Ramondre Stevenson. I always ask this question. Can you trust a Patriots running back? No, never. Have we ever been <laughs> able like to reliably trust a Bill Belichick running back committee ever in fantasy football? No. Stevenson did all great today, right? 16 touches, hundred something yards and a touchdown. Numbers are going to look great. He led the backfield in carries, rushing yards, receptions, receiving yards. He had four receptions for 28 yards. Damian Harris had 14 touches, just two less. So there are going to be days where they have good numbers, days where they have bad numbers. But just like we said for other folks before, the Patriots running back have abysmal floors and are still very touchdown dependent for their moderate ceiling. So if you're a zero RB stand, go ahead, take your gamble. I don't trust Patriot running backs ever, and I'm not going to start now. So let me ask you this question that I'm going totally off script here. If you had to pick between a Patriots running back or Damian Harris, where are you going? Excuse me, Damian Pierce. (laughs) Damian Pierce. Uh, uh, I mean, mean, in Dynasty, no question, Damian Pierce. I just love the guy in general. But I I think there's less competition for Damian Pierce. Yes, there's a whole like Rex Burkhead thing. I just think that the the Texans are going to be in a few games and he's shown us he has that potential to like just give you great days like this. I just think he's a more talented back. I'll just give you that answer. I just, I think he's a more talented back than Ramondre Stevenson or Damian Harris. I don't know. What do you think? Help me with this. Um, I don't know that he's necessarily the more talented back, but I think that he's just in a better situation where he is going to see a little bit more guaranteed volume. I don't know if there's ever going to be a, a time where Rex Burkhead is going to be taking the goal line carries or taking the majority of the snaps. So I just like his situation uh, a little bit better. So I would lean Damian Pierce there. Let's go to another running back here who's coming back off injury. J.K. Dobbins is back in action. 40 yards on nine touches. He had 45% of the running back snaps. Kenyon Drake, though, was a healthy scratch. That, to me, said a lot about what the Ravens want to do here, which is just get J.K. Dobbins involved. They know they're going to take their time. Justice Hill has looked good so far. Lamar Jackson just takes so much of the rushing work away from these running backs. Now, I I traded for Dobbins in Dynasty. Uh, I think that in redraft, you're just going to have to be patient. If you drafted him with the expectation of an RB2 right out the gate, I don't think you're going to get that. But this is a guy that I think over the next few weeks, uh, they're going to work him in a little bit more. He's got some tough matchups, Buffalo and Cincy, and those two teams have both been pretty good against running backs. But I think that once you get like maybe three, four weeks down the line, you're going to start to see a better, healthier J.K. Dobbins who's going to be returning to game speed. And I think that this is a guy that could be helping you down the line come playoff time because that Baltimore Ravens offense is just going to stay in games and they're going to need to run the ball to control games. Up next, we have Jamal Williams who out of nowhere, though he's done it before led the Lions with 19 carries, but even though he only had 46% of the running back snaps, you have to take these stats and numbers into context and did not make me happy. Even though I love Jamal Williams as a person, because I have a lot of DeAndre Swift, both of the goal line snaps or Jamal Williams. So, you know, Swift ran a route on two thir- or three fourths of his snaps, about 72%. So, I don't know, Alfredo, should DeAndre Swift be managers be worried? Uh, up until today, Swift was outstanding from a fantasy standpoint. You loved him, but these sort of numbers, should one game give us concern? No, and I think that a lot of this deals with the fact that he's had the ankle injury, I believe it was, that he's been dealing with. And uh, it's been said that he was going to be limited, right? And this was the same thing that happened last week. He was limited. It's just that last week he happened to go off, and he happened to get the long run. He happened to get the touchdown. And this week, you know, it was a down week. But I, I think that we see this all the time in fantasy where star players like this, the squeaky wheel gets the grease. And I think that DeAndre Swift should, as he gets healthier, be able to handle a, l- a little bit more work. But, I mean, Jamal Williams is always going to be around. Unless Jamal Williams gets hurt, he is going to be around. He's going to be taking some of those goal line carries away from DeAndre Swift. So I think you just you adjust your expectations, but you shouldn't necessarily have to be worried. Now, guys, I think a lot of people are worried about 
Clyde Edwards Elaire. Nothing much of consequence from this Chiefs Colts game, except for the fact that the Chiefs, the Chiefs lost to the Colts, yep. which was just after weird after everyone saw how bad the Colts were. CEH continues to just be hyper efficient. It's weird. This is, I think, the first time this has ever happened, which is a rush one rushing touchdown on zero yards rushing. <laughs> I don't even know how you do that, but CEH, the magic man, did it. One rushing touchdown on zero yards. I, I just don't get it. He also had five receptions on five targets. And I think that's that's what's holding his value right now. It's just his work in the past game that we hadn't seen before. Five catches for 39 yards. And he gets that touchdown on just a weird day for him. He kind of remains a low-end RB2 just based on the team that he's on. So let's do this little fun exercise. Clyde Edwards-Alaire, Patriots running back, just insert name, or Damian Pierce. Go. <laughs> Oh, Clyde Edwards Hilaire. Again, it's because of his efficiency. They are always going to, that offense will always get to the goal line. And whether or not CH is doing great, he gets some receiving work. He somehow falls into the end zone every game. Um, I just feel like I get a, a bit more of a safer score with him. And you just don't know with anybody else. So I'll take CEH there. Yeah, I think I'm the same way. I think I like the fact that CH is getting the passing work. And I know it's crazy because all the numbers actually do tell you to sell high. There's no way he can c- continue this efficiency. But I also don't think that there's really a way that he's going to continue this horrible inefficiency running the ball. I think that just this Chiefs offense is, is going to find itself. I think that right now they're still finding their identity. And a Patrick Mahomes led offense is basically never really out of games. They're always going to find themselves in scoring position. Uh, they always have these fun, creative, quirky plays that they can, you know, do a, a little flip toss to the tight end and use CEH in weird ways. So, I think that just because of the team he's on, he remains a valuable running back too ahead of some of those other guys. Uh, we've got a lot of severance references here. Great show. Watch it. But there's just lots of mysteries and enigmas throughout that show. And I got one for you. Okay. It's the Jets. The Jets are just an absolute Yuck. enigma and make absolutely no sense. You got like Brees Hall getting 52% of the RB snaps and Carter getting 44%. On any given day, I have no idea what those numbers are going to be. You have these four players, Hall, Conklin, Wilson, and Moore, who are getting eight targets. And this is all with the man Joe Flacco throwing the ball. I just have no idea what's going to happen when Zach Wilson comes back. And I like truly do not know what to expect. And this does not make me happy. But as someone who barely has any Jets players anyway, besides some Garrett Wilson here and there in Dynasty, I'm okay with that. But yeah, what do you make of the Jets? I have zero idea what to do with them. Yeah, it's weird. I don't think we're going to be able to figure them out. I mean, Brees Hall went out and ran nine routes in the previous week with just one target, and then he comes out this week and he's running all over the field, getting targeted a bunch. Uh, I believe it was five or six receptions, mm-hmm. and so the the running back snap share percentage has kind of flipped this week, and so. I think conventional thought tells you that this could be Brees Hall taking over the backfield, but he wasn't really even all that impressive either. I think both of these running backs were just very meh. I think the Jets are just, they're just a tough team to figure out. I think that uh, Garrett Wilson went out there and he showed that he's going to continue to get his target share, which I did kind of like, but uh, man, it's hard. It's hard because now you're going to have to try to make that, that, almost excuse to start Garrett Wilson because he's going to be in that wide receiver three range every single week. And you're going to have to find some guys that you're benching in favor of Garrett Wilson. And then ask yourself, do I trust Joe Flacco? Do I trust Zach Wilson going forward? And, and I don't know that I don't. Vic, a guy that your Jacksonville Jaguars have trusted a whole heck of a lot. James Robinson. This has just been absolutely mind blowing. James Robinson said, Hey, Dr. Vig, suck it. <laughs> Because all of your stupid Achilles data doesn't mean anything. So how do those numbers make you feel? 20 touches, 116 yards, one touchdown. He had a really nice long run. He did the same thing the week before. And it just looks, Vic, I'm going to ask you because you are a fan of this team. At this point, like he's got to be the unquestioned RB1 on that squad, right? And he and, and potentially even a top 15 fantasy running back at this point. I think you're getting a little ahead of yourself, to be honest. Um, and I think a lot of folks are too. So let's let's take this thing into context. And first off, yes, I am wearing the original number 30 jersey that James Robinson had before he switched. You take away that 150-yard touchdown run, take away the touchdown, give him the 50 yards. He gets you, what, 12 PPR points today without that touchdown. Travis Etienne did practically the same thing. They are using Travis Etienne a lot, both in passing work, but also in early downs. And he got you like 10.5-something PPR points, very close. 
So I don't know if either of them is, are truly like an unquestioned RB1. It looks like they're using him as a as a 1A, 1B type thing. It makes it hard to know who to trust. As a fan, I could not be happier. I could not be happier that I am wrong about the Achilles data. But again, J-Rob is an outlier. He was an undrafted free agent that was like a top five PPR running back. And he's an Achilles injury guy who's coming back and looking really good. And I love it. But that's a lot of outlier stuff there. But going back to the Jags, I don't know. Both of these folks have decent potential to give you double-digit points every game if they play the way they do. But take away that long 50-yard run on a fourth and one play, and that drops like 11 points from what James Robinson did. So I don't know if he's truly the unquestioned RB1. Time will tell. I think uh, before we move on to anything else, I think it's important to point out, like we could always just take away X play from Y player and they end up with this, right? I think what what stands out more to me and I was uh, very weary of James Robinson because of the Achilles data, but what stands out to me is the fact that he can make those runs. He does have that speed still that he is able to make that long run. So, I mean, we can, we can, you know, X, Y, Z take away runs and take away plays all we want, but Man, the fact that he was able to do that, that gives me a lot of hope going forward. And I will say this, Travis Etienne was involved, but it did tend to be a little bit later in the game when the game was out of reach in the fourth quarter. And the this was weird to say, the Jags had a commanding lead on the Chargers. So, I, man, I think I might have a little more faith in James Robinson than you do, Jags fan. I'm going to give you some some players and some macro data, and I want you to refine them for me. Tell me how, you, how they make you feel. So first guy, uh, DJ Moore, one reception, two yards, though he did lead the team in targets with six. Doesn't make me feel good. Um, six targets in all three games. Baker Mayfield is averaging 14 completions per game. Um, again, Josh Allen had like almost three times that today. And then LaVisca Chenault, Jack's guy, got this really nice long touchdown today. Um, so my question is really, how does it make you feel? Are you buying low on DJ Moore? But wait, there's more. Austin Eckler, PPR darling, four carries for five yards, eight receptions this past week, meaning today. He played 56% of snaps and, 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 and Sony, Michelle and Kelly like combined for 44% and Sony actually even had more carries. So for the whole season, we have Austin Eckler, 32 attempts, 80 yards and zero touchdowns. Obviously he's been involved in the passing work, but he has had zero touchdowns for a guy who happened to fall into the end zone multiple times last year. So how does it make you feel? And are you going to buy low on these guys? Well, first of all, they make me feel gross. Ew, poopy. Uh, <laughs> it's, it's awful. So, yeah, that's how it makes me feel. But I am willing to buy low on these guys just because I I think that what the Chargers are doing right now, let's just talk about Austin Eckler first, is they are preserving this guy for later in the season when they do need to make that run because the Chargers can't go another year of not making the playoffs. And I think that a game like this where things kind of get out of reach and, you know, first of all, I'm shocked that Justin Herbert even played due to the rib injury. But I think that what, what we're seeing here, yes, it's concerning that the rushing production just haven't hasn't been there, but there's always that receiving floor. And for both of these guys, I'll just kind of say the same thing. There's almost no way that it can stay this bad. If they're both healthy and they're both playing, I just don't think that there's a way it stays this bad where DJ Moore is catching one pass for two yards and Austin Eckler is carrying the ball four times for five yards. Anything is going to be a a positive regression to the mean for these guys. And I think that it's one of those things where you're betting on talent. You can't keep a good player down for long. So I am willing to, to bet on each of these players rebounding as the season goes on. Um, for DJ Moore, I do think that something's going to happen where either Matt Rule gets fired or Baker Mayfield gets benched. And DJ Moore is going to start to get a lot more of that target volume because that, that's just what teams have to do. You have to use your best players. I, I can't see them going all season just not using him. And Austin Eckler, I think this is more of a workload management thing. And I, I think that right now, man, that Austin Eckler manager that 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 drafted him in round one is really frustrated they're probably 0 and 3 and they're probably looking to make some desperation moves. So that's a person that I might be targeting in my league to talk to and start up some trades. All right, Vig. We are getting to my favorite segment here in the show. The rehab roundup. You excited? 
I, I do not understand what this voice has to do with rehab. Oh, it's, it's very, it's very, voice. I get it's it. Western. Okay. You should. It's, it's very Western. It's very that. gruff. I'm gonna keep doing it. <laughs> <laughs> All right, let's get into these. Why did you have to do that, man? You made me feel so stupid about my voice. Now I never want to do it again. All you right, here we go. Let's get, to our, horrible. let's get to our first player, Dalvin Cook. He has a shoulder dislocation, Vig. I'm sure there's a lot of Dalvin Cook managers that are very concerned right now. Hopefully most of them have Alexander Madison on their team. But talk to us about Dalvin Cook and this shoulder injury. Uh, it's something he's done before. It's something that will happen again. He's dislocated that shoulder. He sort of had a labral tear in, with that shoulder as well with this, never really had it repaired or anything. So it's going to happen again. But honestly, I I'm not very worried about it. Um, he's probably going to wear a brace or harness and be back and just play next week. That's the sort of thing you can do with this sort of shoulder dislocation. And Dalvin Cook has done this before. So um, may they, you know, is there going to be some load management or something else possibly? But I think I wouldn't worry too much. If you're, if you're rostering Dalvin Cook, he's probably going to be back and playing next week hot damn just put a brace on him and let him run i like it Vic. good call there our next player mac jones quarterback for the new england patriots looks like he's got a high ankle sprain and i, I gotta say man the picture and the video of him going through the, oh, the tunnel so the locker room sad no it was embarrassing do you see how like we've there's been a lot of players that got a high ankle sprain and I'm sorry. And I don't mean to dunk on the Patriots fans or Mac Jones, but I, I'm going to kind of do it anyways. Had any other quarterback of, of like uh, of that much scrutiny, like a Tua Tonga by Loa. If he makes those faces, those like crying faces as two teammates are carrying him for an ankle sprain, he is going to be getting just absolutely roasted on social media. But here we are. Mac Jones has his high ankle sprain, sad face and all, what are we waiting for with Mac Jones here, Vig? What are you looking for towards? We are waiting for you to have some empathy for that player. Alfredo. Okay, I'll have more you empathy. Are conditioned to hate the Patriots as a Dolphins a bit, fan, yeah. but um, so here's what we know: we know that the X-rays did not show an obvious fracture, and, and that seems to be, and, you know, at least it seems to be the case. And that is good news for Mac Jones. What's going to happen? They're going to get an MRI, a much better picture, anywhere from two to four weeks potentially, depending on you know low ankle, high ankle sprain. It is sort of odd that he couldn't even bear weight. It makes me a little worried. Um, so I would wait a little bit and figure out what's going to happen. We'll probably know a bit more tomorrow, but yeah, if you, if you were in like a two quarterback league or super flex league and Mac Jones is one of those quarterbacks, I would be looking for a replacement because you may need one for the next few weeks. Yeah. Listen, I didn't take the hypocritical oath like you did. Okay. I, I don't have to be all <laughs> nice and, and, and proper about injuries. It was just a funny face. Get off my back. Speaking of backs, Tua Tagovailoa, uh, this is apparent back injury for him. It looked more the way his head hit the, the ground, the way he kind of bobbled around. Everyone thought it was a concussion, and it looked like outward symptoms of a concussion. His all he in his own words, his legs were like Gumby, and it's being called back spasms at this point, a lower back injury. But he came back, he played Dolphins won. Is there any concern about Tua Tagovailoa going forward? <laughs> Uh, the only concern I have is that the NFL Players Association slash NFL are looking into whether or not there was some violation of the concussion protocol to get Tua back in the game. I agree. Sounded to look like a concussion. Could spasms do this? I mean, certainly can. But the dude came back. First pass was to like Tyreek, and, and, and it looked great. So um, there may be repercussions from a non-injury standpoint. But best I can tell, Tua's fine. All right, let's get to our last our last player here. I almost forgot to do my voice, Vig, because I know you love the voice. Michael Thomas for the New Orleans Saints. Looks like he's got himself a toe injury. Yeah, they're saying it could be a turf toe injury. We see a lot of wide receivers get that. Again, if you're rostering Michael Thomas, you clearly have not listened to our show at all. But if you are rostering Michael Thomas. Hey, again, he's been good, have, man. He's been yeah, no, he, he's, he has been. He has been. But, you know, that two touchdowns in the first game was pretty impressive. But he's going to get go back to the mean and I don't think he's doing that every game. Well, long story short, again, wait up, wait on the imaging. Let's figure out what's going to happen. Saints wire just put something out 30 minutes ago. This is Sunday night, 30 minutes ago. And we don't entirely really know what's going on there yet. It could be nothing. It could be serious. Um, so I'd wait and find out first before making any crazy moves. And we're going to fly through these waiver wire ads for week four. I know a lot of you guys are going to have questions about this, about ads and starts and everything like that. Please feel free to put these questions in the comments here on YouTube. And I promise you, I will get back to each and every one of you personally throughout the week. 
But let's go through these waiver wire ads for week four. We already talked about Khalil Herbert already mentioned here. If David Montgomery is out, even just for one week, Khalil Herbert needs to be added in your leagues. He is available in about 75% of ESPN leagues. That's just crazy to me. And Alexander Madison, you know, with, with Dalvin Cook, I, I know Vig, you mentioned that he is still going to play, but you also mentioned that this is an injury that can get re-injured. And it's an, an injury that already has been re-injured. It's easy for this to happen again. If you have Dalvin Cook, you should have Alex Madison on your roster. If you don't have Dalvin Cook, go out and grab Alex Madison. I don't. I wouldn't call it necessarily a priority, but he is a good waiver wire stash to be having on your team. Uh, up next, we're going to talk about Romeo Dobbs. The dude was 8 of 8 for 73 yards and a touchdown. Caught everything that was thrown his way. He's available in a ton of leagues, um, but did really well. And as someone who probably seen how he played today, um, will not last on the waiver wire for long. Vig, I'm going to throw out one of your boys here, a Jaguar, Zay Jones. He caught 10 passes on 11 targets for 85 yards and a touchdown. Trevor Lawrence was just slinging that thing, man. Like Trevor Lawrence looked filthy against the Chargers. He was pinpointing that ball in every little single corner of the end zone. And honestly, it would have been another touchdown to Evan Ingram had he kept his feet in bounds. So it just everything looks really good today from the Jaguars. I'm hoping this is a step forward for them. And Zay Jones, this is the guy that we've talked about. Wide receiver two for that team. I think he's a pretty good wave wire pickup to go and stash. Up next, we have Isaiah McKenzie. And, you know, it is hard sometimes to figure out what to do with that offense. But today, McKenzie caught seven of nine for 76 yards and a touchdown, uh, much to the detriment of maybe other players on that squad. But he, again, is available in a lot of leagues and seems to have a great rapport with his quarterback. Second to last player we've got here, Greg the Human Dortch. Flame on because he caught nine of ten targets, Vig. My dude is on fire. I, I I have just fallen in love with Greg Dortch. Like this is just he's the little guy that wasn't meant to do much. And just here he is, week after week after week, nine catches for 80 yards. He was already the wide receiver 24 in PPR leagues. And I gotta imagine after this week, it, he's still gonna be ranked pretty highly. And it's weird because you go and look in your leagues, and he's in the waiver wire nearly everywhere after three weeks of straight production. Something that Sigmund Bloom said when we did our start uh, start sit show. You gotta be really careful when you say that start sit show uh he mentioned that like there is no guarantee that rondale moore gets this job back from greg dortch i know a lot of people are saying that yeah right just because of the name recognition of rondale moore but rondale's never done what dortch is doing he never has and greg dortch has been able to do this three games in a row i think that he's not only just a good ad in redraft he's a good ad in dynasty as well i i like this this combination this chemistry that he's got with kyler murray I am going to one up you here. You picked a Greg Dortch, nine, tar- nine receptions, 10 targets for 80 yards, but I'll give you nine receptions, 10 targets, 89 yards. And that is David Joku uh, tight end for the Browns is just tight end is like this Lance barren landscape. And this guy seems to be doing pretty darn well. And he's just an absolute monster of a human being in terms of his physical ability. He signed a huge contract and somehow it blows my mind. He's available in so many leagues. Grab David Joku. And there you have it, folks. Thank you so much for coming through with us. Those are our waivers. We gave you our macro data refinement. And of course, the beloved rehab roundup with Dr. Vignesh Doraswamy. We thank you so much for listening all the way through. We'll see you next week. Adios. Adios.